Jean Malouin is our next speaker. Again, the uh, first part of our program t- uh, today is really sharing practices and what's happening around the country. Second half, we're going to shift a little bit into the question of does it work. Uh, Jean, <laughs> Jean wears uh, so many hats that I can't even begin to describe them. Uh, she is a, on the faculty at the University of Michigan. She's a clinician here as well. Uh, but for purposes of today's presentation, uh, she's going to speak to you as a co-lead of the Michigan uh, Primary Care Transformation Project, our demonstration project in Michigan. Thanks. Thank you, Marianne. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and i um, happy to be here and tell you some really exciting news for the state of Michigan here and um, building on the previous talks that um, our other speakers have given. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, i um, just going to give you a little background overview on U.S. health care, which um, this is not going to be news to anybody, but just some kind of startling statistics that really um, illustrate why we're doing all of this. Um, and then, as other speakers have pointed out, um, is the patient-centered medical home the silver lining? Um, well, CMS is hoping that that's the case, and they're investing a lot of money in uh, trying to um, build models around, build state-based models. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the specific initiative that we're working on developing in the state of Michigan, which is based on the Blue Cross model. So first of all, um, so in case you have uh, been under a rock or something, um, there's, there's just there's a national crisis in health care. And this, one of, this is one of the reasons, one of the slides that can show you why that's the case. And we are the top line, and highest is not best here. Um, the United States really is double many of the other countries, um, as you can see on this slide, in the average health spending per person. And this is continuing to go up, and there's really uh, not an end in sight. And uh, many people have pointed out that this is definitely not a sustainable model. And that here's one of the reasons. You can see, um, if you look and see where 2010 is on that slide, and then you look at 2050, in the next 40 years, we're expected to approximately double our patient population over age 65. So I tell people these are the folks that we're going to be competing for hip replacements with uh, down the road because there's not going to be enough money to, um, to, to care for all these folks. Because if you, if you know the statistics, you know, the people over 65 are the people that consume a good deal of health care stati- uh, resources, many of them in the last month of their life. Um, and so we, why, why do we cost so much? Well, we do a lot more stuff to people. Um, we do a lot more procedures. Um, and this is a, um, a slide that shows the angioplasty and cabbage um, bypass rates for um, the United States compared to some other countries. Um, this was several years ago. But you can see that we do a lot more procedures in this country. And, um, you know, if the outcomes were better, then we could probably justify some of that. But the, the truth of the matter is that our outcomes are not any better than other countries, and in fact, in many cases, are a good deal worse than other countries. So uh, we're spending a lot of money, but not necessarily getting a healthier population for that. And you can see here, this is the life expectancy of, at birth. Um, we are down on the end at 78.2. This is as of 2010. Um, uh, about four years uh, less than folks in Japan. Um, so we, again, are not really helping people live longer. And also our infant mortality rates are, are uh, uh, considerably higher than some other countries. And you can see there's the, the median line there. Um, we're higher than the median um, of all the um, OECD countries combined as well. And th- this, these, this data is kind of old because it's from 2004, but in looking at current, uh, extrapolating that out to 2010, it's really not that much better. We haven't done, we haven't made a lot of strides in this area. So this is a quote from Atal Gawande, who um, m- many of you may have seen his work in the New Yorker uh, last year, which sort of raised a lot of, um, caused a lot of commotion. Um, but in much of this country, no, isn't, no one is in charge, and the result is the most wasteful and least sustainable health care system in the world. And again, that's uh, probably not too far from the truth. So uh, as you're all here because you're wondering about the patient-centered medical home or you're a believer in it or you're a skeptic and you want to prove us wrong, Um, but a lot of people have wondered if the patient-centered medical home really is the silver lining that can fix this problem. And, you know, I'm a believer that it's part of the solution. I don't think it's all of the solution. I think we have to stop paying for things that don't work. I think we have to – there's many things that we need to do in this country, but certainly the patient-centered medical home is a good start. And 
one of the hypotheses, one of the reasons that people are looking at, at this as a solution is because there's been an observation that the countries that have very strong primary care base um, are actually do much better in terms of population health and that there's thought to be a causal relationship there and uh, we do not, we have a lot of great primary care physicians in this country but we don't have a strong primary care base that gets to all of our population. So CMS has jumped on that bandwagon um, and they have, um, they decided that they were going to release an RF, RFP, uh, it came out actually in June of 2010 uh, which is, um, we had 60 days to reply to this. And what they, and I'm just going to go over because some of you, I mean, I, I could probably recite this stuff in my sleep at this point, but um, probably some of you haven't seen this. So I am going to take just a minute to go through these specifications. And this was the original uh, criteria that came out in June. Um, so CMS said that they would join existing multi-payer state PCMH initiatives. And again, this was, um, so what you, you, as you heard from David's talk, um, we have a very large um, patient-centered medical home model funded uh, by, through PGIP um, here, but it's a single-payer model. So we decided that we were going to see if we could in 60 days make that into a multi-payer model. So it was quite an adventure. Um, they did initially say that up to six states were going to be selected with a maximum number of Medicare beneficiaries at 150,000 per state, which they did not um, hold to that. Um, which was good for us. Um, the total funding that they were going to contribute was uh, less than or equal to $10 per member per month for all CMS beneficiaries. And what they said is that if you have a model in the state where all of your payers are, are contributing $5 per member per month, that's what we'll contribute. Um, but we're going up to $10 per member per month. And um, initially they, they said that all payers had to be using a common payment methodology uh, they had, there was pretty strict criteria for demonstrating budget neutrality for this, um, that we uh, built very elaborate, I say we and that's the royal we because I had nothing to do with this, but um, built very um, elaborate models to um, show how we could uh, justify that the money that we were requesting was going to be budget neutral over three years. And they also said that your payers had to include Medicaid had to include private health plans uh, or commercial health plans, which were at least 50% of the commercial market, and also had to include self-insured employer-sponsored group health plans. So it was a pretty big task, and we uh, took it on, uh, thinking all the while that we would never, ever get this grant. And um, I, so here we are. Um, <laughs> so now we have to do, we have to do the things that we promised we were going to do. Um, <laughs> the award notification was actually on November 16th, 2010. And as I was writing this, I was thinking to myself, I cannot believe it's only been two weeks because I, um, you know, we have just done so much in the past two weeks and, and life for many of us has drastically changed. Um, but they were announced um, on November 16th and CMS decided to fund state, uh, I'm sorry, eight states instead of six states and of which, as you know, Michigan was one. And they did not limit the be Medicare beneficiaries to 150,000. And in fact, when we put our application out, and you'll see the numbers later, but we um, were considerably over that. We had uh, 350,000 Medicare beneficiaries. And we didn't really want to limit that because our, our premise to CMS was that if you want to test this on a large scale, there's no better state than Michigan to do that in. So if you have the guts to do this, uh, we're going to do it with you. But if you really want to go to the 150,000, um, we will uh, scale back and we'll decide how we're going to do that. Um, they did end up having some flexibility on a common payment methodology. The amount had to be the same, but the, um, the way it was paid out as a PMPM versus T codes versus they, they, were, they were more flexible on that than they were initially going to be. And they also said that we're going to be watching you like a hawk and uh, if this doesn't look like it's going to be budget neutral and after maybe a year and a half or two years into this, we'll stop it because we can't afford to pour money into things that aren't working. So that was, uh, that was our challenge. Um, so there's still a lot of details that need to be worked out and while well, we have our first conference call um, on December 7th, which is next week, with CMS to, to start the process. So, and this is just a slide that shows you the um, participating states, of which Michigan is the second line there, obviously. And you'll see there's 477 practices. Um, 
from Michigan. And what this is, is all of the um, PGIP designated practices, less the practices in Michigan, I, I'm sorry, at University of Michigan. And we are not participating in this, which is somewhat ironic from my perspective. Um, but um, because of the fact that we're participating in another CMS demonstration project, and there was not uh, allowed to be overlap. But you can see the total practices are 948, and of that we have uh, just a little bit over half, which is, um, so this is, this is going to be a very visible and um, uh, very exciting project um, to participate in. And you can see that in year three, some of the states actually had proposed some growth, and we did not build that into our model because we were already way beyond the pushing the limit on this, but we may be able to expand a little bit, and we haven't discussed that with CMS yet, but um, it's a possibility we're going to explore. So now back to what we're doing here in Michigan. Um, so we called our project the Michigan Primary Care Transformation um, Model, and um, I'm going to just go through a little bit of the details of this for you. But first I wanted to just talk a little bit about Michigan, because those of us who um, were born and raised in Michigan and have lived our lives here um, are really very um, proud of our state. Um, it's had a lot of challenges lately, financially and otherwise, and um, so we really want to showcase the stuff that we're doing here in Michigan. And a lot of that, um, as David mentioned, it's really built on the Blue Cross Foundation, which I'll talk about very briefly, because you've heard a lot about that already. But So we have about 10 million people in this state. We're the 11th largest state and the 26th state to become part of the United States, home to more, more than 11,000 lakes and the largest state forest system in the world. And for those of you who like to hike and camp and uh, travel through Michigan, it's a beautiful state to be in. Um, we have the longest freshwater shoreline in the world, and we have uh, Sault Ste. Marie, which is the oldest town between the Alleghenies and the Rockies. And although Michigan's called the Wolverine State, there are no longer any Wolverines in Michigan. Now, my brother, who lives in East Lansing, has been saying for years that the only good Wolverine is a dead Wolverine. So, so he will be delighted to hear this. So, but... There's some sobering statistics with Michigan as well, and I'll, I'll explain these a little bit because they're a little bit confusing, but this is um, from the um, uh, Healthy People 2010 um, uh, statistics that was updated in March of this year, and so what they do is they rank all the states based on some um, health care indicators, and so we're, for instance, we're 45th in um, heart disease deaths, so that means that 44%, I'm sorry, 44 states actually have lower heart disease death rates than we do. Um, so there are some, you know, so in this case, being high is not good. Um, so we have some areas to, to work on here. So tell you a little bit about the model. The basic premise is, as, as other people have pointed out, is that better primary care delivery leads to better health outcomes. And support for this uh, practice transformation will take place through a collaborative network of physician organizations and payers. And this, um, the administration of this demonstration project will actually um, facilitate learning. Um, David had mentioned the regional collaboratives uh, facilitate growth of those types of, of learning experiences um, and help people build on the, the infrastructure that they've already had uh, built with their patients under medical home designation. So um, one of the criteria that CMS said was that you have to have designated practices, and Blue Cross Blue Shield has its own designation process that is um, um, parallel to NCQA in some ways. I think it's a lot more process-focused and a lot less IT-focused, um, and, um, and it is what we've built our, mo our model on here. So um, we really want to see if we can build on that and bring other payers on board and other money on board to help finance um, additional transformation. So our vision is that we want to use the, um, this demo as a catalyst to redesign Michigan primary care. And as others have pointed out, you know, you really can't, you can't expect one payer to fund a transformation of a practice. And it's not fair to the payer, and it's not, um, it's not easy for the practices. Now, Blue Cross Blue Shield is a very large payer in the state of Michigan, and um, we have been able to do substantial amounts of transformation with, uh, with just the funding from the single payer, but just think what we can do with all the other payers that we're going to bring on board. Uh, so what we want to do is take this infrastructure and really work on developing some evidence-based care models, picking a few items that have been shown to make a difference. Um, as Diane mentioned, uh, care coordination, things that really can save money and, and improve patient outcomes and make for happier patients as well. 
Um, we really want to see if we can focus on those things and disseminate those across a broad area. So um, we really feel that we have something to offer to national models here. And, and I, like I said, I think this is going to be a very visible model here in Michigan. And, and the interesting thing that I've always thought about, this, about what we're doing here in Michigan with Blue Cross Blue Shield is that anybody who's tried to do practice transformation locally knows it's a very, very difficult process. And what really what we've, what we've been doing in the state is sort of uh, practice transformation from a distance. Um, and um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. And I think we, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has been very successful in doing this. And what we want to do now is see if we can take a few aspects of those and focus on those and, and disseminate that across the state. And again, we really want to um, see, uh, I think ACO models are, you know, we're hearing more and more about that. And I think the uh, patient-centered medical home is really the building block or the foundation of these, of successful ACOs. So we really, really want to start that in this country. I mean, in this state, in the country. What the heck? Um, so, so can that really? Can this really work? Can building a robust primary care network and infrastructure can that really reduce healthcare costs and improve health outcomes? No one really knows. And the concern that um, that we've always had is that some of this stuff takes time. Um, in order to prevent somebody from being on dialysis from um, un uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, in their 70s, you have to start working with them 20 years earlier and, and really working on their health. And so these, some of these fixes are not three-year fixes. They're not one-year fixes. They're 20-year fixes. So we hope that the folks that we're partnering with will have some patience that uh, it does take time to do some of these things. So again, is it possible to disseminate these models over multiple geographic areas with different organizational structures, um, varying IT capabilities? Um, if you look at an organization like Kaiser, um, what they've, you know, they have very uniform uh, structure as far as um, IT and communication, that kind of thing. This is a much different situation because we have small practices, we have large practices, we have people using Excel registries, we have people using high-tech registries. So it'll be a very different very interesting thing to try and see, try and work on. Um, so the, the last bullet here, can multiple payers and physician organizations come together and agree on common models? And um, I would have never thought that this was possible until this summer um, because we have not um, been able to do that in this state up until now. And we really thought that nobody would want to sign up for this. And we, and we actually, when we had people um, commit to this, we said, you're not committing. Uh, this is not a binding commitment. You know, we realize that you're committing to this without a lot of details known. So uh, you can back out if you want to. We, won't, we don't want you to, and we'll try and get, get you to stay with us. But um, it, it'll be interesting. We have our first steering committee meeting in a couple of weeks, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> So current stakeholders in this model, um, there are currently 17 public and private payers that have signed on with us, including um, just about all of the um, Medicaid managed care plans, um, and seven of the large uh, commercial payers, uh, 32 of the physician organizations uh, in the state of Michigan, um, and again, as I mentioned, 477 designated practices. And these are the beneficiaries that will be covered under this. And so it's, it's almost 2 million patients, people. Um, and when you think about, you know, that I said that 10 mil, there's 10 million people in the state. So it's about a, a fifth of the state that will be covered under this. So even though it's a lot of people, it's, there's still a majority of people that will not be involved in this. Um, and we certainly can't forget development efforts with those folks as well. So these are the participating peers. In the interest of time, I'm not going to, these are all in your slides. I'm not going to read through them. Um, um, and then these are all the uh, Medicaid managed care plans. And the practice participation criteria, uh, practices had to belong uh, to a physician organization um, that participated in PGIP. And, um, we realize that not all practices in the state belong to a physician organization, which is actually kind of an umbrella um, over individual practices that unites them in some ways very tightly integrated, like the University of Michigan, and in some ways very loosely integrated. Um, but the reason we have to work through POs is really uh, over the summer we had, you know, 60 days to do massive communication, massive um, uh, uh, work, and we really... Um, that, so that was the organization that we worked with, is the physician at, at that level. Um, practices need to be PCMH designated, maintain this designation throughout the entire years, and they also needed to agree to work on the four selected focus initiatives. And these are all 
P these are uh, selected PGIP initiatives, so we're not, re we're not creating anything new. We're just choosing to focus on certain areas. And one of the things that Blue Cross Blue Shield has never done is really focused on specific areas. I, David has this thing about the provider, patient provider agreement, but um, we've never really um, kind of uh, told people that these are certain areas that we want to work on. And, and so what, but we, what we picked for these areas are things that we really think will make a difference. And I'm going to just talk briefly about these four areas. So care management. So this is a, it says he's cured and there's a ham. Obviously, this is not, a, not, a, not an example of a good outcome. Um, so um, care management, I think it's, it's really focusing on the team-based approach to care. And this is, this is the kind of thing where you take a moderate risk patient, a newly diagnosed diabetic, um, and you want to prevent them from going down that continuum to, have, to developing the complications from diabetes. So, so these are things like self-management support. These are um, what some... Uh, vendors would call disease management kind of thing, but it's working with patients uh, to, to help improve their care. And this is the kind of thing that happens in between the physician office uh, visit, office visit usually. And, you know, it can happen with a nurse or a pharmacist or other folks, other members of the healthcare team that are helping the patient with their goals. Um, so self-management support, effective interventions. This is, I was able to get in one last lecture about diet and exercise. And um, I think, you know, this is, I've, been a, I've been a primary care physician for a long time, and I think that um, what we tend to do, you know, patients come in, they, we say eat less, exercise more, we document it, and then they come back three months later and they weigh more, and we say, gosh, you didn't listen to us. And um, so, so there's a whole um, body of work on what self-management support really is. And this is, is it's, it's not lecturing to the patient on what to do. It's actually meeting the patient on their terms and, and saying, what, what's important to you? And it may be something that is totally, you would have never guessed or you would have never suggested to a patient, but it's something that's been bugging them. You know, I have a diabetic that I asked, I was talking with her about this, and she said, you know, I drink, I drink six Cokes a day, and I'd like to cut down to four. And I was horrified because I had no idea she was drinking six Cokes a day, but, um, but I was glad that that was something that was really important to her and that she felt she could work on. And you have to remember that people with chronic um, conditions generally have failed not this is a generalization but a lot of a lot of them have failed at every goal they've tried to set for themselves as far as healthy behavior and so really saying to the patient there's nothing that's too small what can you do that will make you feel like you've succeeded that's that's what self-management support is and there's a real art to it and I think you know nurses do it really well physicians certainly can be trained to do it well but it does take a lot of time and I think that's the limitation for us is that, you know, we have 15 minutes to see a patient, but isn't, wouldn't it be nice if our nurse could do a bunch of follow-up with them in, the mean, uh, in between our, our visits? Uh, care coordination, right care, right place. Um, this says offhand, I'd say you're suffering from an arrow through your head, but just to play it safe, I'm ordering a bunch of tests. <laughs> and this, this, this really does happen in the emergency room. <laughs> um, it really does. And so this is the kind of thing, you know, we all know in primary care that once our patient goes to the emergency room, they are just sucked into the black hole. And because they look bad, you know, they look sick. And I, they see me, and I say, oh, you always look like that, you know. And, but <laughs> so I'm, so I, there's no crisis, you know. But, but seriously, this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, we really, I mean, you know, people talk about care coordinators and guided care model, care management plus. It's kind of a Band-Aid on a really broken health care system. Um, but it's what we need. It's one of the things that, one of the tools that we need right now, I think, is to, to train our patients that um, when, you have, when you feel like you need to go to the emergency room because something's wrong, call us instead. We can talk to you. We can decide what to do together. And ideally, if you need to be seen, we can get you in with your own physician who knows you and can, can, moni you know, can monitor your care um, much more effectively. And patients love this stuff. I mean, it's not like we're, we're keeping them from care. I, you know, this is something that uh, patients who have very complex medical problems would love to have someone help them through navigate the healthcare system. So it's it's a win for the patient. I think it's a win for the healthcare system as well. And then the linkage to community services is the last um, area that we're going to focus on. And this is kind of the umbrella over the whole healthcare system. This is the Wagner chronic care model. And um, when you think about, you know, the patient sees you for, um, you know, 15 minutes, and then they live their life in their community, and, and how do we partner better with the community? There are some really, really bright spots in this, in this state, um, people who have done tremendous regional um, things within the communities, and how do we spread that? So this will give us a vehicle to be able to do that, which I think is really awesome. 
So this is the funding model that we are talking about. Um, so for commercial payers and Medicaid, we actually um, ended up at 776, which is a weird number. I have no idea why we didn't round it up or down, but um, as the total payment by those folks. And then for Medicare, they'll pay an additional $2 per member per month um, in additional care management support. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. And the reason for that, which they did ask us, and we had a very, fairly simple answer for them, is that there's a much higher prevalence of chronic conditions that need management in folks that are over 65. So we felt like that was really justified, and, and I, I guess they did too. So, um, so this is how the payment model is going to look. Uh, the governance, I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but we have a steering committee that will be partially appointed, partially elected. Elections are actually going on right now. Um, and then an advisory committee that's composed of a lot of other um, folks around the state, including the professional medical associations. So the next steps we have, um, as I mentioned, we're establishing the governance structure with our first meeting on uh, December 16th. Um, and we uh, have a lot of work to do um, in determining what the right data repository model is here and how do we what do we need to do to aggregate data from CMS and from the other payers in a way that's secure and will be useful um, and meaningful to physician organizations and practices um, ideally because um, one of the things that is frustrating you know as a physician is we get lists from individual payers about their patients and we toss them out because that's not how we manage our populations and so if we could get, ideally, I mean, this is like my fantasy, but if we could get claims and clinical data put together and provide that, that would be sort of the ultimate goal that I would have. And, and the question is, what do we need to do between now and when this, when this demo starts, which is seven months from now, um, to actually just get this thing up and running and then while we keep marching towards a long-term vision. Um, the, the clinical model, we need to develop that. We've got a lot of great folks who are doing great work in the state um, in teaching and training and, and working with practice teams to get them to function as a team. And how do we build on that? How do we get these folks to all sort of agree on the co sorry, common model that we're going to support and try and disseminate? And then a communication. I can't even, uh, you know, I can't emphasize how important communication is. And, um, we had a very narrow, as I mentioned before, um, uh, group of folks that we communicated with over the summer, but how do we spread that out and how do we make sure that everybody um, understands what we're doing and believes in it and has an opportunity to challenge it and question it and hopefully uh, start to become a believer as well. So I just wanted to give a quick um, little nod to our planning committee who worked countless hours. Uh, over the summer, um, many, 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 many hours working on uh, developing this, and then the development team of which um, Marianne was the, was the lead, I would say, and um, I probably had a thousand emails from Marianne over the summer, uh, some of them at midnight, some of them, yeah, I mean, it was crazy, um, but this, this, is, this is a group of folks who did a tremendous job, worked very, very hard to, to make this happen. Um, so that's it, and we'll hold questions for later. Thanks. Thank you, Jean. The worst part of those uh, emails is that Jean responded instantly, no matter at what time and no matter how many thousands she was inundated with. Um, so uh, everybody worked hard to make this happen, and now we're just launching the next phase to make it a success.